textbook to help science teachers at the K-12 levels teach science or find resources to teach um, science better, more effectively. Um, we don't always know if the materials that we're developing are useful or if they're being used unless we receive that direct feedback. And we know that as teachers, you are bombarded with surveys probably hourly, maybe more than that. We don't want to, we do not want to ask anything more of you. We're just simply here to help. But um, if you would like an answer key, we're going to ask that you just complete a very short Google form. This is going to help us show our impact, show that yes, we're reaching teachers, that they're using it in their classrooms with X number of students. It's going to ask you to put your school web page, and we cross-check and make sure that you're listed as a teacher with that school, mainly because we don't want to inadvertently give students answers to, to keep. We want to have a place for teachers to get a secure answer key that students are not able to access. And so I think Stephen had mentioned in our first session, if you're a new teacher at your school, we apologize in advance. It's going to be a little complicated. We will get it to you, but we want to verify that you're a teacher with that school again so we avoid um, getting answers in the hands of students. So use your actual teacher email. Don't use mrcool at gmail.com and expect us to believe it's you. Well, I, or make sure that your name fills up. You know. <laughs> right. Uh, the other thing is, um, please don't share the answer key with other teachers. Instead, please just send them that link. I will be more than happy to give this answer key to every teacher in your school that's interested, or in any school that's interested. But um, by filling out that answer or that, that request for an answer key, that's, again, helping us with our numbers and showing impact that what we're creating is useful to teachers. So for our learning objectives, what we're hoping happens with using this virtual lab is that students are gonna understand and be able to describe using an acid-based indicator, that students are gonna be able to make observations of a few different systems and determine whether photosynthesis or cellular respiration is taking place, and also that students are gonna be able to describe cycle of matter into and out of organisms within it. And um, and hopefully we're, you know, we're going to be able to cover all that in this next part. We begin with an overview. And um, kind of as we detailed in our previous session of classifying matter, in this overview, um, we have a guided notes worksheet that kind of helps students as they begin this lab, this virtual lab investigation with some background information. Um, if you click on this, it is going to prompt you, if you're not used to this, this is a, a command that you can use with Google Docs that is going to automatically put the Google document into, it's going to force it into your drive. So it's not like a warning, like some kind of computer virus or something if you've never seen this screen before. Mm -hmm. Thank you for calling on me. Um, <laughs> what if I don't have a Google account at all? I click this, what will it do? I think it's going to prompt you I, didn't to, I think it's going to prompt you to sign into a Gmail account. So you might have to create a, a Gmail account in order to, to do that. Yes. Okay. And if that is a problem, or if you yes. have res okay, yeah, if you have reservations with creating this, we would like to request that you email k12 science at purdue.edu, and we can send you a PDF of this. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. No. Yeah. Place? I know. No, that's beautiful. Okay. K12 science at purdue.edu. That, that is a, an, a general email that is going to reach Bill and Stephen and myself. Um, and basically, that's, that's, that central email is going to help us send your request so that they get addressed as quickly as possible. Is it this one? Oh. oh. I might have closed the back. page. All right. No. Oh, that's where you Sorry. Okay. I was trying to get back to where you were. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and make a copy because we are in a, a Gmail account. But again, we can get you a copy if, if you don't want a Gmail account, fine. Um, just let us know and, and we can get you a copy of that. Sure. Okay. Um, in this, this is our guided note and uh, my copy of it. And it's going to, we we'll try to loop everything back. So it's going to have that address to get you back to our um, virtual photosynthesis lab. Um, but what this is going to do is it's going to walk us through a few questions that are going to correspond with this overview information. So um, if you look at the very first question, what do living things need to survive? And I went ahead and kind of guided this. 
Um, all of these things, you're welcome to modify this. Once you get a copy of, of this into your Google Drive, or um, like that, we can send this as a Word document if that's better, however you like, you are welcome to make any changes you want to fit the needs of your classroom. But this is how we went ahead and set this up, just to have something to discuss. Um, we might think about similarities and differences that, that plants and animals need. Um, as we're going through this, we think about, you know, they, probably two common things that we know plants and animals need, water and air. Um, a lot of times we might think of animals using oxygen and glucose for cellular respiration and producing carbon dioxide. We might also think of plants using carbon dioxide and sunlight um, for photosynthesis and then producing oxygen and glucose. So those are some examples of things that we might also think of, I don't know, like animals, maybe they need shelter, they maybe need food, you know, they're, they're just other things. I guess we said glucose, but I kind of covered the food. But how do we know whether carbon dioxide, which we seem to have mentioned for both animals and plants, is actually being used or expelled by a plant or an animal? And um, what we know is that carbon dioxide as a gas dissolves in and reacts with water. And when it does this, it happens kind of quickly as, it, as the carbon dioxide dissolves into water, it forms this substance called carbonic acid. Now I realize this is a middle school session and I don't think it's necessary for students or maybe even appropriate. And it probably depends on the grade level and the students and how you, you know, the how their background and where they are. But I don't think it's necessary for students to be able to identify the chemical formula for carbonic acid. It might even just be appropriate to say that carbon dioxide dissolves into water and forms an acid. You might not even need, need to name it. But um, we went ahead and put this information in here. You, again, as the teacher, decide what's appropriate for your students. But the point is, is that it forms an acidic environment. And um, as it forms, it almost immediately breaks down into a hydrogen ion and another part. And I went ahead, I called that a bicarbonate ion. But again, that might be, that might not be necessary to name that, but that's what it is. So the fact that that carbon dioxide is reacting, or it's dissolving in water, it's reacting with water and forming an acid, and that that acid, as soon as it's formed, it's dissociating, it's breaking down and giving us a hydrogen ion, that is causing a pH change in the water. And when we get those hydrogen ions, it's causing the pH of that water to lower. So it's becoming more acidic. Um, so as that carbon dioxide, as that, car as that acid forms, it's making the water more acidic. We can observe the pH of this carbonic acid solution using a pH indicator, an acid-base indicator that we call bromothymol blue. And a lot of times we'll abbreviate this as BTB. And the thing about bromothymol blue is in a neutral, just plain water solution, BTB is green. And that's between us in a pH range, thank you, Bill. <laughs> pH range between 6.0 and 7.6. And if you're at all familiar with the pH scale, um, we know and generally we speak about the pH scale ranging between 0 and 14, but right in the middle is what we call neutral, and so 7. And between 0 and 7, we say that's more acidic, and between 7 and 14, we say that's more base. So this is green. You can, a little bit, I can see right here sitting in the lab that it's green through this kind of opaque bottle, and um, and it, it must be at a pH. I know that if it's showing green, it's between 6.0 and 7.7. As the, as the carbon dioxide reacts and dissolves into the water, this bromothymol blue, or BTD, is going to change color from a green to a yellow. So the more carbon dioxide that gets dissolved in, that reacts in that water, the more yellow, not the more yellow, it's, it's going to trend yellow in color. It doesn't get more yellow, it just becomes yellow. Um, by contrast, <laughs> if we remove carbon dioxide from this system, then um, we're removing that carbon dioxide, we're getting less hydrogen ions, and we're going to, um, the pH of that system is going to start to rise. And so as the pH rises above 7.6, we're going to visually see a color change from green to blue. And so we see um, BTB is blue at a pH greater than 7.6. So the more carbon dioxide that's removed from solution, the more basic the solution will become. 
and we show a quick, um, I think we're going to change because I mislabeled this, we show a quick video right here on the page. Kind of what we just talked about. There's our yellow, when we add a little bit of dilute acid. Get that blue. And that, I, I love acid base indicators, those are really neat. Um, we go to, yes, question. Uh, the question said, how do you explain the idea of basic for kids when you first tell them about the pH scale? before they really understand ions. Okay. Um, I mean, I mean, you could say... It, I mean, that's on a very fundamental, you know, that's just what I say, because they kind of understand something's acidic. They've had, like, uh, orange juice or pop, and yeah. they could feel how it's right, acidic right. Mm -hmm. and stuff, and so I'm like, well, it's the opposite of acidic. If it's, if it's not acidic, or it's, it's going to be more basic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, too, um, I like comparing it to things, like you said, that, that they kind of know about. So, yeah. like, orange juice we know is acidic. But what's an example of something that's basic? And so we think about, well, like a soap. Soap tends to be more basic. Or cleaning products. And, and that you, kind of gives you, us a... You drink soap? I've had my soap, But I compare it to things that they might soap. know. About I totally see that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe comparing it to certain household ingredients is, is, um, is one way that you might... Um, but yeah, that's a really good question about um, addressing that when they haven't been it because yeah, at the middle school level they might may not have um, talked much about ions at this point. And they said for middle school they don't need to know about ions. Yeah, that's just a I chemical agree. property and, and share care common examples. Yeah, and, and people talk about you know in here they said that if you just go through household items and talk mm -hmm. about what's mm -hmm. what's acidic and what's basic, they kind of school, start to get an idea. Yeah, yeah, I, and I've heard boys like. Basic is slimy. Slippery. Yeah, slippery. Yeah, yeah. And bitter. Acid is not. Yeah, acid. Well, and that's where you kind of go. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's like it, there's not a, a hard rule on that. So yeah, uh, that's where I would use a uh, for that last question. Um, colorblind. Really colorblind. Yeah, they asked us. That's where I would use a pH meter. Um, right. Like one of the yeah. veneer ones. Uh, not promoting veneer. Yeah, not that we're promoting any one company over another, but um, we have here. Oh, yeah. Just the pH meter. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to show the computer. I'll tell you the first. <laughs> uh, something like that. That does a really great job because it shows you the numbers. Yeah. You can see the numbers. And so if you have one of these in your bathroom, it, you know, obviously that will help those students. Because uh, a lot of your, a lot of the most indicators, your litmus strip, all those are mm -hmm. color dependent. Yeah. But if you get this one, or a bar from the high school one uh, is they probably have some sort of pH meter at the high school. That would be my recommendation. And I think that um, I think it would be totally reasonable in this lab. You, I don't think, and I think that's a little bit what we were talking about with the overview. You don't even really need to talk about the hydrogen ion necessarily. You could keep it all just, hey, we have carbon dioxide. We've talked about carbon dioxide as something, you know, we're breathing it out. You know, some plants are taking in carbon dioxide with sunlight and using that in a photosynthesis process, and that that carbon dioxide can dissolve into water and make it more acidic, or we can take it out of the water, which we'll talk about, and it, and it gets you know, more basic. <laughs> something, was it last year you did the blowing into the straw? Yeah. Um, I think that would be complimenting this very well. Yeah. Doing the, having them with the water. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, you could use you could use the pH meter to see the pH change, or just your indicator. And that would work blowing into it. That work with this with drive? chrome thyme blue exactly. Okay. Yeah, and that, because that's exactly what this lab is showing. Anyway, um, chrome thyme blue is not harmful to the snails and the elodia that we're going to be using. It's totally inert to them. It's not going to hurt them in any way. Um, and I think likewise, it wouldn't hurt. I mean, we certainly don't want to have the students drink it, but I think using a straw to blow into a clear cup of water with some of this. Um, 
ETD in, in that water, it is going to show that flow change as you're taking your breath and blowing it into that water. Um, you're going to see it change from that green to yellow. I like that compliment. Yeah. So, yeah. Someone asked uh, basic and alkaline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? The same, the same I think difference? It's, it's a, I think there's. I think they're synonyms. I think I, they are synonyms. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't going to yell it out. Oh. You had yelled out. <laughs> the elementary guys, Please you got to throw that one out. No, they're, yeah, they're still used. Okay. okay. All right. So um, this was a, actually a recommendation on that Flynn lab, so back that we connected to at the beginning of this, that, that students are shown this happening with bromthymol blue. I'll say that when we first used um, a few drops of bromthymol blue in the water sample that we used in the lab, it immediately turned yellow. So we adjusted it with a couple of drops of base to bring it to a green color. And we'll yeah, see that also suggested um, by Flynn when we're setting up our samples as well. Um, so in this lab, we're gonna be, again, like we said, we're gonna be creating some different systems with a combination of plants and animals and BTD solution. And again, we're using the BTD to help us visually detect whether carbon dioxide is present in each system. That's really what we're looking for and that's the point of this. So, if you didn't use that and someone happened to have a something that could detect mm -hmm. carbon dioxide? Um, carbon dioxide, the sensor we have is only for an air sample. It does, it cannot be submerged in solution. With, what did you use to make it? Because it was uh, the water we got out of the lab was slightly acidic. It what was. Did you use? I used just a couple of drops of a really dilute sodium hydroxide solution. But um, what's something we could use if we didn't have chemicals? I think you could. I want to say you could probably use a really dilute like soap water, maybe some bubbles, like a bubble solution. You might try that. I, I would try it. I don't know if that would work. You just not, have to. I mean, honestly, you're just, you, you're going back and forth. So yeah. If you put a little right too much, you might have to go back to something yeah. more, you know, acidic. So you're going to have to go back and forth until you find it. Right. I just didn't know how common those chemicals were. Um, the the two the acid and the base that we used was a very dilute a point two I think it was a point two molar sodium hydroxide and a point two molar hydrochloric acid and those at the high school level they probably have just but all of what them. about us young I mean can we use like just like vinegar would that work I think right? I think vinegar would work because I think again we're just trying to drop it below six point zero and vinegar it is a weak acid but it still has a pH of less than six. So I do think, I think white vinegar would work. And the question was asked, would distilled water help avoid all this? Um, we were using a deionized water, and but I don't know if the beaker that we were using earlier, we could have been mixing vinegar. It could have been the Because that's a long, well. we're on the far side of a fairly, a, a, a building that's not used very often. Right. They try to, you know, isolate us from the rest of the world. <laughs> um, but so we'll I, I kind of wonder, <laughs> I kind of wonder if part of that's in the pipe. Yeah. It it's an old building. The bottom line is just make sure before you do this, you play with your water to see where it goes so that you yeah. get it to a point where it's blue when you start. Yeah. Right? Right. Yeah. But the still water should be. Should be. It good. should be fine. Should be. Yeah. Yep. And we'll talk about too when we use this, suggests that we use spring water and we had to do something else with that because that gave us something different than what the deionized water did. But we'll talk about that. So um, we are doing this as a virtual lab, but this is this is definitely a lab that could be done in person um, with the right materials. And um, the you know this this elodia that we're getting that we're going to talk about the seed, the snails that we're talking about can be purchased from aquariums. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, can we go ahead and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll go ahead. can we yeah. bring them in? Yeah. yeah. So and this is where we I'm going to go back and explain. So some of you received kits and some of you didn't. And those of you who didn't, sorry, but we only have so much money to send out, and the teachers who signed up first get the access to it's that. It's not because we don't love you. It's not because we don't love you. It's because you're not fast enough. No. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened is um, you will get, and I'm going to explain this here in a little bit. I'll give you the code and all that stuff, but I'm going to send in an email to the people who yeah. paid. We ordered, we ordered the snails and the... Elodia. Elodia from Flynn. Um, they were supposed to send us a sample ahead of time so Sarah could do the lab. They didn't. They were supposed to FedEx it and get it to us yesterday. It didn't come. So, you know, you guys have all been here, so now this is where we are. But 
if you're going to order and you don't have the Flynn to get from, even then the other companies that I went to around our area um, said you need to order at least two weeks in advance because they must order from all the pretty much order from the same company to get their sales. And so if you go to your local aquarium world or whatever you have, um, they can probably get these for you, but you need to give them enough lead time so you have them. The catch is also once you have them, you have to you have to take care of them. You can't just get them and put them on a shelf. They need to, they're live, and so you have to make sure that they're, you know. You put that stuff in the aquarium, you're like, never die. Right, but so you got to have. It's hard to kill it. You have to have a setup so you're ready to go. So don't don't get it two weeks in advance and then not do the yes, last for two weeks. that's a big thing. Don't release them in the wild. Thank you, because that was something else we were getting ready to mention. Yep, <laughs> yes, was, please yep. don't do that. Yeah, and in fact, that's an important disposal thing. Uh, we actually have several episodes of our superheroes of science where we talk about invasive species. And I don't know, is Elodia invasive? I, I, I was thinking like it was. Oh, is it? I think it is. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All kinds of yeses. So, yes. Yeah. We, we, so, do not release this. Uh, but, yes, we, um, we got into a bit of a supply chain issue. We did not, we ordered several weeks in advance. It wasn't like we were down to the two-week window. It was several weeks. I think it's just a they, supply chain issue. Well, I think they just forgot. They forgot us. They just forgot. But, okay. but there's still a supply chain issue to make sure you do it enough in advance. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Well, well, if you do the lab, though, you can just have an aquarium and grow your own. There, yeah. There you go. That's, That's what we used to do when we did the bottle biology. We we had an aquarium and we grew our own. Okay. All the time. Yeah. So the question was asked, so they're not in the kits, correct? They are not in the kits. When this session is over, maybe tomorrow or whatever, at some point, I will send out an email to the people who got the kits for this, and I will send you an email with the code and how to order them, and then they'll ship them straight to you. Okay? They are not terribly expensive. They're actually, they're pretty reasonable, I think, for a dozen to get them. So it's a... I don't know what budgets are, but I want to say that you can get a state of 12 of both for less than 15 minutes. Is that the same as Elodia? Is that just like an Acris? That's what we used to I think use so. I think that's when we did the bottle it. biology yeah. stuff. But yeah. All I know is this, yeah. someone else said yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. All I know is those snails just about can't kill. <laughs> They're hardy. <laughs> we like drain the aquarium in the classroom for the summer. Then I filled it up in the fall. It, it's, it had live snails in it when I filled it up. That was awesome. Yeah, okay, Pestor called it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I hear, yeah, I've seen where people use that to look at things. So we're going to set this up. We're going to create eight systems. Um, we have eight jars with lids. And the thing is, with the lids, we want to make sure that we um, secure tightly when we're doing this. We're filling each one. Um, the, the formatting got a little strange here. It's about four, mostly full, four-fifths full with our, it, it's suggesting spring water. Um, I used a 100% spring water, bottled spring water with this. Um, yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Still, like, like Vanna. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're nothing like Vanna. <laughs> <laughs> so the other spring water, we, these are the afters. We did before, and we have pictures, and um, after for this. But, um, when we first put in the spring water and added our drops of CTD, it was blue. Like like up above in our video, it was pretty blue. We had to add a couple of drops, just a few drops, of really dilute hydrochloric acid. Vinegar would work um, just to bring it into that green range. Um, right now, this uh, is... Will that hurt the animals? Hurt no. The animals? Nope, it does not hurt because we're bringing it into a neutral range. And, um, and then it's just going to be the what happens... Once you set up the sample, once they start in green, it's just coming from their normal life processes. And so it's not going to be enough to adjust the pH. It's not going to hurt them in any way. Or at least that's what Flynn promised. And that's what I'm going off <laughs> with head on, on that. I'm pretty sure that, that this is true. So we won't hear him screaming? No. I, Since it didn't come two weeks ago and we, we I got told right. we didn't right. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay. So, we're, so we're adding two to three milliliters of the bronchitol blue to get it to that, that correct pH range, that green color. Um, and, and like I said, we have used a couple of drops that put in the molarity there of hydrochloric acid, but other weak acids could work. 
Um, and then we're going to number these. So in um, these jars, we have, I put the number right on the lid. You might have another way to, or you could probably number the glass right there. But um, in bottles one and five, we have our water with the BCD and that green color, kind of just pH adjusted. We're putting in a sprig of the Elodia. In jars two and six, we have our BTD adjusted correct pH with a snail. And in jars three and seven, we have both the Elodia and the snail. And then in jars four and eight, to which I have um, here as, a, um, as an example, those are our controls. And so then bottles one through four, we, we seal those, um, you know, tightly cap the lid. And then we put jars one through four near a light. So I found for this jar four, because I can only do the control right now, um, found an open window and put it near the, the sunlight. But I think you could also use an incandescent light bulb, um, something like it, like if you have a grow light or something. You can use. And then um, jars five through eight, we're placing in a dark place. And it says for several hours. Um, I don't think it needs to be something where it's days. I don't know for sure. I'm excited to get the samples when they finally do come in and, and find out for sure. Um, I'm thinking probably this could run up to a day and you and you would probably get some good results. So if you did it one class and then they came back the next day to observe, I think you'd have something. I think uh, when they come, we'll know for sure. Right. And we'll put on there how long we, we have will, to put them in. We will update as, as we, yeah, it's, we, we don't know. As far as disposal, um, this again comes from the Flynn lab um, materials that we have, but they're not harmed by the BTD pollution. They can be returned to their place of origin, whether it's your aquarium or, you know, wherever, wherever you got these. But it says um, if they're purchased from an outside source, they shouldn't be released into the local environment. Um, in fact, we have had several um, natural resource professionals tell us that it's really best with some of these, especially if it's invasive species, to, didn't they say place bleach. it roughly? Oh, bleach it. Yeah, they put bleach. One of them said put bleach in it. Okay. Yeah, I think you're right. That is one of the... Think I'm right? You just think I'm right? Really? Yeah, huh. I, I'm not going to 100% huh. say you're right, Stephen, but huh. I think that might be. Uh, also, did they did they say put it in the trash? Probably. I think it's directly in the trash too. But oh. Bleach sounds like a safer way. To say. Someone said freeze first. I bet. Really? That might be a good one. I don't know. I just threw an aquarium when I was done. Because it's we did the bottle biology thing. So I'm gonna ask a question, yeah. Dave, and if you're gonna yeah. do this in a minute. Yeah. So when you do get the samples, mm -hmm. you're gonna do little videos just like on the other lab that you did, and they're gonna be able to see this so that students can do the observations before and after. Am I jumping ahead? Nope, this is exactly so this brings us to our results, and we set up a table with before and after pictures. Um, we would love some feedback, whether you think pictures are going to do the trick, whether we think that even there was short video clips or are we taking videos? You can suggest it if you want me to hate you. That's <laughs> uh, fine. It's fine. I th we're kind of thinking. If you want a video clip of it, it, I mean, if it's like four or five days long, I'd have to do a time lapse. But if it's only 15 minutes, I could do that and then I could that run in 20 minutes. I can speed it up. Oh, that's true. I can do a short. Uh, which would be better? Just the video of the after, before and after, or a video or a what do you think? Pictures of time before lapse. and after. Time lapse. Or a time lapse video. Yeah, I'd have to see what the video shows. The time lapse would be kind of cool if you could go. I do time lapse. The color change, right? Right. It'd be fast. Yeah. It'd be, yeah, because I'll speed it up. That would be neat. And before and after would be good. Maybe, and maybe with the, the samples that are in the dark, I don't know. It's just pictures for those, maybe? Because how would we film? So that one, maybe, I see that. Maybe one with pause before and after pictures, and then you see that? Yeah. Before and after photos on the page, you click on to see the video? Yeah. Oh yeah. I like that idea. And I like the idea of people. I like, idea. I like the idea of, of the students making predictions. So if you had right. maybe some pauses, then they could. What's going to happen next? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, so on the after, if you want to use it virtually on the after, do we not want to show that before a click? 
so they can make predictions. And they get a click. They have to click the city after? Yes. Would that be better? That one, yes. Now, All right, I can do that. Okay, I can make that happen. Thank you. To correspond with this table, um, we have a lab observation sheet. Again, it's going to prompt you to make a copy. And this is exactly what you're going to see. And, and this is where then students can um, list it. This is where they're listing. You know, when they set it up, they're, they're in a list, you know, one through four. This is placed in direct place. This is five through eight. These are placed in darkness. And then what they're seeing after as well. So this is the handout that goes with it that can be printed off that then mimics what they're seeing on this page. This is what we've come up with so far because this is what we have so far. We have the control and the BTV so far. Um, and really, they both did exactly what they were supposed to do. They both made the control. Nothing happened. They looked the same in both, in both ways. But then we get to our data analysis. And this is really, I'm going to open it up at this point to our keys so that we can discuss this. We're going to see the table. We're going to get an editable copy of this table. Again, it prompts you. I thought you said editable. Editable. I Edit thought we were going back to the cake. Yeah. <laughs> no, not back to the cake. You had me cake. We're, we're going to ask them to, to make a call. Like, are we seeing photosynthesis? Are we seeing respiration? Maybe we're seeing both. Maybe in the case of our control, we're seeing neither. And then we're asking them to write out their justification based on the evidence um, that they have available. And we're going, oh, and this is where we're going to um, jump to our key So again, this is a key that if you complete the um, the request up above, that you will get emailed a copy of this. So this is ready to go. We just need you to request it, and then I'll um, email it to you, no problems at all. Um, but again, it's just to keep it away from students. Um, but this is what we expect to happen. And again, I, I'm excited to try this and see how it compares. But, um, but these are our, um, based on our evidence that we should get, what's happening. So one through four were placed in direct light. And when we see the Scrivener or Lodia, what, we, what we're going to notice is afterwards, we're going to see that solution turning blue. And blue indicates a basic solution, what we talked about at the beginning in our overview. Because Elodia would be exposed to light. And photosynthesis would be removing carbon dioxide from the system. So that when carbon dioxide is removed from that system, that it's becoming less acidic. So that means it would become more basic. And it would be it would move on the pH scale past 7.6. It would it would increase from 7.6. And that's when our BTD is going to turn the blue color. In jar two, we only have a snail. And so after, we should see a yellow solution. And that this is indicating um, that the snail is undergoing cellular respiration, that it's, it's expelling carbon dioxide into the solution, and that's going to make it more acidic and turn it yellow. And so we're saying retrichia. Does the structure say it's put one in? It's, I, They're small. Are they small? Uh, Just asking. We get. We get 12. Oh, we only get 12? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And there are, let's see, how many of them get? So one, two, oh, just like that. three, four. So I think you could put three. Or they could use it for more kids. Or, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Maybe we'll do for a couple. We'll do. I don't remember what they call it. I, I see the comment. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not, sorry. I'm not. Sorry, I need to speak up. Yeah. Read that loud. <laughs> well, we'll get. This will help my kids to realize that plants don't only do photosynthesis, which is a common misconception. Yes. Yes, it yeah. is. I was under that misconception until a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I don't, I don't understand don't why, but oh. like all. <laughs> Nothing living. It was like almost an argument. It was, between yeah. Us. So you're going to tell me blood's blue. <laughs> Yes. 
I was thinking about this when you were talking and, and I, whether they do this or I was thinking if I was teaching this, I think I would want to have the kids before we get going too far. Do a, a just a, a line of paper and do colors. And so that they would see like, OK, so when I start to go to more basic, it should turn and, th and I can mm -hmm. actually color with crayons or markers or whatever. That way they would remember that that's what's happening when they see their color change. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that way they can, did you have that in there? Well, right? I was going to say, um, if we opened up, so our guided notes page that we have, um, the second question on this is to briefly explain how a pH indicator such as bromphenol blue works. That might be something more like on the back or underneath. You might take some colored pencils and, and just and sketch that out. Yeah. I think like your scale and then and then color those ranges. Because I think that's important. When the kids start to see the color change, I think I would forget like, oh, which it's yeah, it's yellow, but what does right. that mean? Yeah. That's a really good point. And I can look yeah. and see real quick. Oh, that means it's becoming yeah. more okay. Yeah. Um yeah, for, for jar three, so this is in the light, we have both the Elodia and the snail, and um, it's going to stay green. And because it's, it's indicating a neutral solution, but the plant is photosynthesizing, it's also respiring, but the photosynthesizing is creating more, um, more of an effect than what the respiration is in the presence of light. And the snail is respiring, and so they're sort of canceling each other out and, and in keeping that solution green. Keeping it in, in the new and then we have four, nothing, that's our control, and that's exactly what we saw. Now, sample five through eight are kept in the dark. And sample five is really kind of the stumper, I think, for this, and that's where we only have the Elodia, and it's in the dark, and it turns yellow. And yellow indicates an acidic solution. The Elodia is not does not have access to the sunlight in this sample, and so it, it can't undergo photosynthesis. Um, and in the absence of light, the Elodia um, is producing C2. It's actually undergoing cellular respiration at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I got to go back yeah. a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, they, they said that the amount of snails you place in the jar depends on the size of the container. Okay. You can also use this as a talking point about um, touching back on carrying capacity and limiting resources, yeah. Ooh, that's which, a really which I really yeah. like that. Yeah. And then someone said, Tanya said, it, if you use paint strips from hardware store for those colors, oh. that would also be one. Uh, those are good ideas, yeah. And then um, I do jar one and two at the same time. Then as to predict what will happen when both are in the same jar and set up jar three. Oh, okay. So they kind of see one and two happening independently. Yeah. And then. And then because then the jar three has, the yeah, make a prediction yeah. because then your jar three has both. Okay. Okay. That's, a, yeah, that's, that's an interesting way to, yeah. Okay. So jar six is still going to be yellow, but just a snail, but it's in the dark, but the snail is still going to be undergoing respiration. And um, so it's, it's putting that CO2 into the water, and so it's turning yellow, respiration. Number seven, the sprig of Elodia and the snail both, again, yellow. They're, the Elodia does not have access to the sunlight, and so it's, they're both only undergoing the respiration. And then again, eight was our control. On the, um, the data analysis, just a blank copy that the students get, once they've done all that, they have a final question to answer. And then this is, there was only a plant in system five, or bottle five. So why did the DTD indicate an acidic solution? And on the key, um, courtesy of Flynn, this is the explanation that we took from there that um, photosynthesis and respiration occur in green plants when light is available. Uh, photosynthesis being the dominant process over respiration in that system that's exposed to sunlight. But then when you take that sunlight away, it can only undergo that respiration. Sarah said, I tried to get discussion about the processes canceling each other out, or would or would one be stronger than the other? That's kind of what you were saying. Right. There's, I think, yeah, yeah. I liked how they worded it as a dominant process over respiration. Yeah. Um, and I think the Flynn lab, if you click on that, they go, they have a little more in-depth that I thought was a little higher than middle school. So I, 
I thought a lot about it. I didn't end up putting it or having it um, placed on the web page, but definitely they get a little more into the reactions happening and so you might be able to at different levels maybe talk about them. So my question I guess for them is is our goal is to make this a lab that you would use or modify or whatever. Are we missing anything in here that you would like added to this that maybe we haven't put in there already that would be a benefit for you? Um, and if you don't answer this question right now and later you hit this, um, I did mention earlier you can, Sarah did too, um, K-12, K-12 science at Purdue.edu. Um, okay. Um, if you want to email us later, if you go, oh, yeah, you guys talked about this, that would be a great place to send us an email and just saying, hey, can you guys add this to it? Yeah. I like the comment was just made. Instead of referring to them as jars, refer to them as systems. Because mm -hmm. these are closed systems. Yeah, right. and, and so in our table, oh, I guess I didn't change it there. And I'll go back and change that. On, I guess that was the key. But, um, in the table we did, and I, I completely yeah, I agree with that. that you, yeah. you told me to change that to table. I remember if we that. changed that to system instead of bottle or jar or whatever. So I, I have been trying to refer to those systems, I agree, because it is capped and it is kind of, yeah, I tried to make sure it was the same on all the um, the corresponding docs that, that we created for this. And I'll go back through and double check if I missed one. I added that K-12 science at Purdue.edu. I'm also adding the, the website of our main website for the College of Science Outreach, just so you have that for other stuff as well. It's just a good, it, it's a good one to go to because we do add a lot of our stuff off of there that will take you other places. I'm also going to, and I know a lot of you were here last time, but when the videos are made on here, um, they will get put up to Superheroes of Science. And I'm gonna give you that link. And if you have not subscribed to Superheroes of Science, would you please do that? Um, that helps with our numbers like we were talking about. And Superheroes of Science has a, I'm gonna use a, a vast array of opportunities for you to enhance your science teaching. That was like big words. <laughs> Well, like a car salesman right there. Yeah, I, but I, but I, but I, but it is. I mean, there's just a ton of stuff on there. Very fascinating. Sorry. Yeah. I think. Oh, and and to get back, I guess the one thing I, I. Feel like, we will take all of these suggestions. Yes, we will. Any all the suggestions you guys put in. So if you have one, you're like, well, I do this already. Yeah. Put that in the chat. We're going to save that chat. And we'll add that for the new teachers too. Because like you said, sometimes teachers are kind of just forced to do this. Right. And uh, they're in a little over their head sometimes. We all felt that. And um, so yeah, it'd be good to have your guys' suggestions from the field as a part of that. We appreciate that on their behalf. I wanted to show, I forgot to mention this too. This is going back to the guided note again at the beginning, but um, where I, I did something I had thought of if I was gonna do this was um, making a quick sketch of a plant and an animal together, like in a system. And um, I think this first one is showing you how carbon dioxide might flow between the plant and the animal. So again, that flow of matter. But then also um, making a quick sketch and showing how oxygen might flow um, within that system as well. And so I think um, that gets a back a little bit to that flow of matter in the system. That's where that was. I think, I think it's a good point. Maybe you can add suggestions for new teachers who are being required to use it. That's what I just said. Yeah, who said that? Did you read that? The one on here? No, I don't have the chat on my screen. Well, that's what someone just said. So, yeah. <laughs> then, yes, they are. Yes, we are. Thank, yes, thank you. Angelique. Angelique. Okay. Sorry. I was. It was after I saw it pop up is when I said it. It wasn't like it was I read it pop up. I'm like, hey, do that. All right. Just to clarify and clear up my possible misconceptions, since pH stands for powers of hydrogen ions, does a low pH mean low number of hydrogen ions and a high pH mean a high number of hydrogen ions? Or is it inverse?
So a lower pH will go with a higher number of hydrogen ions. And a higher pH goes with a lower number of hydrogen ions. But I don't remember learning that pH stands for powers of hydrogen ions. What was percent? percent. I don't remember that either. <laughs> I, I'm going to look it up I, real quick. I but, think sorry. it's a function. I think it's a. Someone else is going to beat me up. But I'm going to yeah. try I'm sorry. This is a good thing to bring up. Yeah. I will say that um, I had forgotten. I think a long time ago, like in like when high school, I learned about plants undergo cellular respiration, but I had forgotten about this. Stephen was telling me, "No, I they they do." But I thought, "What? No, plants don't respire." And then I was looking this up, and um, I cracked up at one of the things I found on the internet that said um, why you should not have plants in your bedroom because you can suffocate at night when you're sleeping because <laughs> take your oxygen and, and give off carbon dioxide and I just laughed so I thought no 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 I remember now I remember plants also over fire but I had just forgotten that it's been a lot of years <laughs> so now I've, I've looked at a couple places potential of hydrogen or power of hydrogen Okay, power. I've never heard power. I've never heard. So that's, never. Yeah, very. I learned so that's, that's yeah. good. But yeah, the a higher pH is um, fewer hydrogen ions. Mary Ann, I'm totally trying that. And she put uh, during remote learning. She uh -huh. had kids put a leaf underwater in a clear bowl or mug with a quarter to hold it down. And after a while, you could see the bubbles on the other side of the leaf. Oh. And then, so, yeah, and then someone else said power of hydrogen ion. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's there, right? Yeah. Well, I'm glad to know that what it really means. Yeah. Oh, pressure the tree, the more bubbles in there. That's cool. Ooh, very cool. Yeah. More hydroxide ions, I saw. Yeah. Totally good video. Floating spinach disc. Yeah, and, and yes, um, Rachel mm -hmm. has a guy as hydrogen. Ions go down, hydroxide ions go up. Yes. Yep. Loading spinach. Let's do something spinach. I love it. Oh, I love it. Very cool. Very awesome. Hey, Shauna, she called you out. <laughs> We're probably just looking at the, at the chat. Uh, we will, we should mention at this time, though, bring us back to the um, Superheroes of Science channel, that um, when we get these samples, if we end up doing the um, time lapse of the, uh, the pictures for us to click on for the after, um, all of these videos are going, are housed on our Superheroes of Science YouTube channel. And I gave that link again. Shauna is trying to give that lab. <laughs> good. Oh, good, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad, Kara. This and again, we appreciate the suggestion. Last year, teachers wanted to see this turned into a virtual lab, and um, we're trying to honor those suggestions and. Um, if, if you have ideas for labs that you'd like us to think about developing in the future, we would love to hear those suggestions from you. We can't make promises, but we will definitely consider. Um, well, I would like say, as you yeah. see, things we do are mostly based off requests from teachers. Or just cool stuff that people have mentioned, like putting these in there. <laughs> so, just to recap, uh, 
we gave you the e or the email to send us an email, okay, 12 science at purdue.edu, if you have suggestions or comments or other things you'd like to have done. Second, um, definitely gave you the link for the uh, Superheroes of Science YouTube. And we also gave you the link that we did gave originally for the uh, website that was created for this activity. And then uh, lastly, we also gave you the email, or no, sorry, the email, the website for just College of Science Outreach. So you have multiple ways to get information from us. Um, and sometimes it's just as simple as saying, hey, I'm looking for this, can you send me this? We're more than happy to do that. Don't, don't search for hours and hours when you're trying to find something when we can help you in like 10 minutes. And we do check our social media messages too. And so if you're like on, you're on like the YouTube and you may just make a comment, we have to prove all the comments. So right. one of us will see it. So a couple times a week, at least we go through and look at them and reject most of the comments. And well, uh, if, so they're not, if they're not appropriate or <laughs> on task, we, <laughs> yeah. Um, we are on Facebook and Twitter, and um, we try to put the same types of messages there. We have different, you know, different audiences reach different types of social media, but we're at Purdue SOS. But then this is our YouTube channel that comes up, and we wanted to point out a couple of things. Uh, most importantly, how do we get to the virtual labs that we are presenting today and tomorrow? Um, when you open it up, this is our, the Science from the Experts is our, kind of where we started, and that is our biweekly um, interview with a science professional or STEM professional. Um, these are scientists, uh, engineers, mathematicians that are doing research today. This is what's being funded, current research. Um, and they are just, I don't know, they're, we have, they're available on all podcast platforms, but we also, um, thanks to teacher suggestions, um, we started putting those as a YouTube interview as well, so those are listed. Um, next, we have our science demo playlist, and tomorrow afternoon, our session will be on science demos, and so we're excited about that one. So I won't say too much about that, but um, our kids' STEM degree, I'm going to come back to that one here in a minute. Um, right now, to get to our virtual labs that we're presenting, if you go, this, this one right here is Science for Kids, and you're going to see at the end of this, high school and middle school labs, if you view our full playlist, you'll find our, our web page, our landing page for these virtual labs. and here, the classifying matter is what we um, this did this morning. And so you're going to see the link to that virtual page and everything that we went through. You'll see the link to this one here tomorrow. Right. Yeah. We'll be putting the, the photosynthesis lab up next. But you can see our other virtual labs that we've created here as well. Um, right now, this is, we're just we're trying to develop as many of these as we can to be helpful. And now, if we go back to the um, the kids STEM degree, I wanted to make sure we pointed that out as well. So our third playlist on our channel, uh, if we go there, um, this is a, we have different grade bands, but we do have one for middle school. We have a level one kids STEM degree. Um, I think we're going more middle school STEM degree, not kids, because originally we had, we had developed these for K through grades K through five. And we ended up getting some that were more middle school appropriate than trying to force them into the elementary level. Um, we're slowly getting more and more videos, but the idea is for level one, we have 10 videos. They're between three and five minutes. They are kind of enrichment. They're all science. We have graduate students here at the College of Science help us make these. Um, and it's just kind of fun for students to learn something neat about science. There are quizzes that go with each of these videos. And after, when they watch the video and take a quiz, they get a code. If they get all 10 codes, they can enter those along with their name and it will generate their very own personalized Purdue University uh, middle school STEM degree for free. That, this is a totally free program. So a comment was just made. And Lynn, um, you couldn't have asked at a better time. It would be amazing if you could do some demonstrations of some chemistry labs that typical teachers cannot do because of disposal issues. Um, so I think you'll be amazed at what we have available. And we're, like we said, we're also willing to do, if we don't have something that you would like kind of specifically made because it's something you're teaching, and we can do that fairly easy, we'd be more than happy to do that. But I think you, um, if you come tomorrow afternoon, you're gonna Talk see some more detail. You're gonna see some demonstrations that you're gonna be like, okay, that's cool, and yes, I can't do that. Yeah, that's kind of our 
big thing for tomorrow afternoon is, is exactly it, those. And on it, and let us know what they are because we we actually have the chemistry department's uh, lecture demo person who is coming to work with us several times this summer, just doing some of the things. I mean the the hydrogen blue one. Um, but that is one that they used to do that they are not allowed to do in the chemistry labs anymore. And so the different amounts of hydrogen, so they're not actually even allowed to do that in the chemistry labs here anymore. So we had him, we met him and recorded him doing these so we could see that. And uh, they'll be using these for intro chemistry too. Yeah, they are really well. <laughs> Hard on the ceiling tiles, you're right. Yeah. But they're not allowed to do these. And they're not allowed to do these because of the sound. Right. And I'll tell you that when they did this last one, it was loud. You could feel it. You could it feel the wave. Right. <laughs> yeah. What was the last one? Some can dispel the idea that climate change is can't be. Sorry, I just saw. Uh, comment, and most of you are reading these too. Yeah. I need something to dispel the idea that chemical changes cannot be undone. My kids come up with the idea that physical changes can be undone and chemical changes can't. All right. I was going to say some of them can't, so I see why they well, under, assume all of them can't. Standard temperature and pressure conditions, some of them are not able to, but if we do, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. That's that's a good yeah, that's a good suggestion. Oh, and being this fourth of July, how fireworks are made and what gets his collars would be an excellent podcast for people to listen to. Yes, it would. <laughs> if you don't like watching videos, feel free to subscribe to <laughs> our podcast. <laughs> do what? I do want to, and Sarah mentioned this earlier, and it was a teacher at NSTA that made this comment, and I love it. Um, they do podcast walks. So how many times do your middle school kids say, hey, we want to go outside and have class today? Well, and now you got to decide how you're going to do this, but it, the, this was a high school teacher who said they would tell the kids, make sure you have your phones tomorrow, make sure you have earphones, and they would have a podcast that was like 34 minutes long, and the kids would go outside and they'd do a walk for 34 minutes. And then they would come back in and discuss the, the podcast. I thought that was an interesting way to get the kids out and still learning something. But I like the idea that they come back and then immediately they would talk about it because then you just don't want kids listening to music for 30 minutes. But anyway, it's too hot in Florida, they say. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I saw in Arizona, it was hot there too, but. You still found a day every once in a while. Yeah. 